This video is The White Stag by Kate Serity, Part 5. Chapter 3. The White Eagle of the Moon. Hunar and Magyar were prepared for a long journey into untold lands, but they could not foresee that this journey would last many long years. They could not foresee that there was to be no more peace for this people until they had reached the land of their destiny. They did not know that when they left the Blue Lake and left the last unclaimed, undefended land, had left Azu, Asia, the land of the rising sun, and entered Erb, Europe, the land of the setting sun. They knew how to cope with the wild beasts of the mountains or the occasional onslaught uh, slot of marauding gangs. They knew they were hardened to the burning heat and freezing winds of the plains. They knew how to pa pa pacify hostile spirits, but this time they encountered something that was stronger, more dangerous than any of these, the desperate resistance of people who were defending their own lands, people who had found what the Huns and Magyars were seeking, a permanent home. If they ever needed the armor of belief and the swords of purpose, they needed them now. Illegitimate, tragic years. Tragic for themselves because ensuing cruel wars... change their very souls, made them fierce wild wars of the once free, carefree hunters and tragic for those who stood in their way because they were crushed by a pitiless, relentless torrent of savages. They swept across Cynthia, leaving a path of destruction behind them, smoky ruins, desolate fields, and a multitude of the dead. In vain did Magyar attempt to divert them towards less populate north to less the less populous north. The Huns led by young Bendigas swept on. The wings of the white eagle were were stained with blood, and his piercing cry heard over the whole world. For years there was no rest for them. They could not rest. Like a sharp wedge they had driven themselves into Europe and now they were surrounded by enemies. They had to go on or perish. Not until Bendigaz was a grown man did they find a heaven from the terrific storms they themselves had created. On a narrow strip of land between the river Tanis Don and the river Ra Volga, protected by the south by vast stretches of quicksand and blackish swamps, they found a stronghold that no enemy could surprise them. And more, once more tents were raised around the altar to Hadur. Once more men and women sat peaceful around the campfires. But these were different tents and vastly different men and women. The tents were made of rich silks and velvets filled with plundered treasures carried by hundreds of captives. Their clothes were heavy with gold and precious stones. Warriors were armed with swords and vicious javelins and the rift between the Huns and Magyars had become a gulf that they could not bridge over if they tried. Here in this haven of peace, the beautiful, the beauty of a slave girl and the coming of Attila served the last, severed the last thread that held the brothers together. The Magyars were content to stay in this sheltered land, but the Huns were restless. They had tasted battle, and it was to their liking. Most restless among them was Bindigaz, who had tasted power over thousands of men. He knew that he only had to command, and his warriors would go through fire or water, through danger or torture, to carry out his wishes. But he knew that, that winter was 
would be upon them soon, and many wounded had to be cared for. A tired army was sure to be defeated, so he used his power and told his men to restrain a hard task for him who wanted to go on more than any of them. At night he could not sleep. The sounds of of his charging army and clashing swords and their wild shouts of vic victory echoed in his heart. He was like a cage eagle waiting for the day when he could spread his wings again. One night he left his tent and rambled around aimlessly in the sleeping camp. He wandered to the closure where the captive tent stood near the banks of the river Ra. The night was cold and silvery with moonlight and silent and he could hear the river gently lapping against the banks. It was a sweet, soothing sound like the lullaby his mother used to sing. And he listened. A as he listened, a change came into the rhythm of the river song. Now it was sad and yearning, and he, he could hear words. Someone was singing nearby. The melody coiled around his heart and drew him down the grassy slope, down to the river's edge he went. The soft grass deadened his footsteps and he saw the singer before she heard him leaning against a tree so close to the river that her moonlit figure was reflected in the water stood one of the captive's girls Bendigas stood motionless waiting and listening her deep sad voice seemed to melt the fierceness around his heart the restlessness left him and he was at peace the song came to an end. The girl turned away from the river with a a sigh. She saw Bendigaz. She made a move to run away, then shrank back against the tree and faced him defiantly. There was contempt in her eyes and pride in the lift of her head. Bendigaz wanting to say, do not be afraid. But now he could not, for there was no fear in her eyes, just cold, proud contempt. He walked closer. He could have touched her, and still she faced him defiantly. What is your name? He asked. He asked, and his voice was gentle. Alecta, Alecta, he repeated slowly. Alecta, your eyes are cold as ice. Do you hate me? She looked at him for a long time, then she turned her head away. No, not now, she whispered, always before, but not now. She was speaking the language of the Huns, yet it wasn't the same. To ben Bendigas, the words she spoke were like her elusive reflection in the water, the, the same words he knew, but suddenly different. And suddenly, the words of her song rang into his ears. Lead me westward, white eagle of the moon, oh lead me on silvery rays of the moon, westward I long to fly. Alecta, where did you learn that song? Where did you learn the language of my people, he asked. She looked at him surprised. It is the language of my people, and it is the song we all knew, know, the song of the white eagle. The white eagle explained, ben Bendigas, who are you? Who are your people? Alecta lifted her head proudly and stood like a white flame before him. I am the daughter of King Ashkenaz, and my people are the Simmer, Simmerans, homeless wanderers upon the earth, lost in the wilderness, downtrodden by the Scythians, slayed by enemy swords, and torn by the fangs of famine for long years that I can remember. We have never lost hope. We believe that someday we will find the land of peace, believe that someday the leader promised to us by our great forefathers Father Gomer would come and lead us to the land, the, the leader who shall be called the White Eagle. And now we have been taken slaves by you, Bendigaz, and all hope is dead in our heart. The White Eagle is but a song. Bendigaz listened to her rushing words in silence. Then he said, Alecta, do you know what people call me? Your name is Bendigaz, I know. He held his hand to her. Alecta, listen to me. My name is Bendigaz, the White Eagle. My people are also seeking the land of peace promised to them by our four, our four people and, and seeking a land of peace promised to them by our forefather Nimrod. We have been slain by swords and torn by famine on the way. 
Now we kill and destroy not because we want to, because nothing must stand in the way, and, and we must and will reach the land of our destiny. While he spoke these words, Electa came slowly closer to him and took his hand. He closed his strong fingers on hers and went on. Tomorrow, Electa, your people shall be free. Tell them that they may leave or stay with us, not as slaves, but our brothers. Tell them that our strength will be their strength and that we will never forsake them. She had been looking into his eyes intently, searchingly. Now she smiled. I can speak for my people now, Bendigaz. I will follow you wherever you go. Will you follow the white eagle of the moon westward? We will follow the white eagle of the moon westward always. She stepped back and slipped away between the dark. She might have been a dream, but her voice floated back to Bendigaz, growing fainter and fainter. Lead me westward, white eagle of the moon, oh lead me. Bendigaz, back in his tent, was also singing softly. O oh, silvery rays of the moon, westward I long to fly. As he drifted into sleep, his last thought was westward, but not alone, not alone anymore. Hans and Magyars rejoice in their newfound brothers, the Cimmerans. And when Bendigaz and Electa announced their decision, the downtrodden, abused, enslaved Simeons could hardly believe once more they were free and that they were equal, and more they were brothers of the proud Huns. Hope again lived in their hearts, and they accepted Bendigaz as their leader unquestioningly. Their happiness seemed to have touched a gentle chord in the wild heart of the Hun warriors. For years they had known only hatred and defiance. To them, the friendliness of this people were like cold water to thirsty men. Their restlessness and longing for action were diverted into a new channel. Tirelessly, they listened to the songs and tales of the Simeons. A strange turn of phase, a new tune, a good story made them shout with mirth and admiration. Proud, beautiful Electa captured the heart of everyone. The day came when she and Benegaz stood at the altar stop steps, their hands clasped over the flame torch. Huns, Magyars, and Simeon, old, young, sick, and well, waited and bowed their heads, while Damus, Damus, Damos, the blind prophet, poured the water over their hands. They spake the age-old vows. Through fire and water I come to thee. Not fire nor water shall take me from thee. Okay, that is part five, chapter three. I will be back tomorrow.